Uh, hi, my name's Alison Wheeler from Gold Coast Australia. I am a high performance business coach and I am about to be on Prosper's uh, podcast and I am could not be more excited. Uh, we are going to delve into really how can you be, how can you live your fullest life through the expression of business? How can you make sure that the outside and the inside are all in alignment, prevent burnout, and take your business to the very next level. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet to now the exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. I'm your host, Prosper Tarovinga, and today we are going to be unlocking your full potential in both business and in life. Our guest today, Alison Wheeler, is going to be helping us with high-performance coaching for business owners that are ready to break through that proverbial six-figure ceiling and step into the seven-figure realm of success. Now, Alison, how are you doing today? I'm fantastic. Thank you very much, Prosper, for having me on. Absolutely. Well, the pleasure is all mine. I can't wait to jump in this particular episode, given the fact that you've had over 13 years of transformative uh, coaching and a background in occupational therapy. And also you are a best selling author on Amazon. We're going to be going through all of that and uncovering the journey um, of Alison Wheeler. So for those that are wondering, Alison brings in a blend of expertise that is uh, unique in its own realm, uh, not to mention she's also a professional athlete with Miss Fitness Australia, proving that uh, dedication and perseverance aren't just concepts, but ways of life for her and her clients. Now, Alison, I could go on and on and talk about your accolades and everything else that comes along with it, knowing that, you know, when people work with you, it's not just about building a business, but it's actually sculpting a masterpiece that aligns with their values, vision, and their life. Tell us, how did you stumble upon this? Uh, to coaching, look, my... <clears throat> If we go back, I think I've had a coach in some iteration for a lot of my life, right? So uh, my uh, father was an athlete. He was a runner. So we kind of got brought up in, in the sporting realm and to have a coach was not unusual, right? If you want to perform at your very best, you find experts and you ask for help and there's things that you will never be, particularly as an athlete, you can't see yourself from the outside, so there are always things you're going to miss, no matter how well you're going, there's a next level. So I got introduced to the idea of coaching very early in my life through sport. Uh, you really wouldn't think of high performance, getting to high performance levels without having a coach. It doesn't make a lot of sense in sport. Uh, it's about speeding the process up and making sure you don't do silly things along the way as well, like injure yourself or take yourself out of the game. And then uh, career-wise, I moved in. I did a number of different things. I started in, uh, I thought I was going to go down the path of doing dietetics, started down that path, decided that wasn't really it, went into sports, uh, science, that wasn't really where I wanted to go, ended up in occupational therapy, and I think I liked it because it was very focused on the person and the center of their life. Uh, we learned about, things, you know, studied chicks eat me high and flow and things like that. So you know, how does someone live a, a fully expanded life, how they actually want to do, uh, whatever that means to them. And then from there, that's just kind of iterated into then my husband started in network marketing. Well, I worked for myself in that. So I went from working for someone else to working for myself, built that up. I worked for some um, or had some, some very large clients here in Australia. And then I had my daughter, um, which at the time I was training to go to the Commonwealth Games, but I had this 
compelling urge to to have my daughter and it just wouldn't go away. So I worked out that if I had her within the three-day window that we had available, um, that I could still train back to the, go to the Commonwealth Games. It was all going to work out just fine. So I was back in the gym a week after she was born um, and then I was like, well, oh, no, nah, this isn't what I wanted to do. So we made, you know, I was a mum and just focus had changed. So what am I going to do now? So uh, change sports, change directions. My husband started a network marketing company, uh, a network marketing business. I took that over, built that up to seven figures. Um, and then when uh, the pandemic hit, it really changed the dynamics of that business. We couldn't run our events, but I'm actually very grateful because it gave me the opportunity to refresh and relook at my values and what I wanted. And it had all changed. I'd, I'd outgrown that business. I'd done everything that I could. I'd run every accolade there was. There was just no more growth for me. So I was like, okay, now what? So that's when I really went back into the realm of coaching on my, like in my own business specifically. Obviously, in the new England business, I coached for years and years. Occupational therapy, I built up a coaching practice with that as well. Uh, but I've iterated back into uh, business coaching again. So many iterations, I think, of uh, versions of myself, versions of my business, changes and realignments because I don't, for me, one of my biggest values is always growth. So if I'm not growing, that's not healthy for me. It's not healthy for my family. And, well, I think you're either growing or dying, really. So uh, when you stagnate, it's just this, you can start to create other problems in your life so you've got something to do. I'd rather create moving forward. And I love helping people to be able to create. I think I've always come from that background of helping. How can I help? How can I help? And, you know, I love business. So it kind of aligns together. And I think having the background of being an athlete for so long, you know, you learn, you learn a hell of a lot of disciplines. And, and it's not all that different. Business and sport. Not that different. Not for what it takes to be successful. Mm. Now, that's a very long-winded answer, but hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> well, it's been a well-lived life, so there has to be, you know, details to it. And I really appreciate you taking us on that journey. Now, Alison, you know, obviously growing up with a father who was an athlete, like you said, uh, did that put a bit of pressure on you to be a high performer yourself or was dad just a good role model uh, for what it looks like to, like you say, have discipline in your life? I, no, I, you know, my parents always used to say to me, why do you put so much pressure on yourself? They they never put pressure on me at all. And sometimes I wish they had. Um, so I could just break the boundaries, right? I like to push and break the bound, see how far you could go and break the boundaries. And but they're there, and I didn't understand this when they would say it to me. We just want you to be happy. It used to drive me nuts. I'd be like, give me something that you actually want me to be, so at least I can disagree with you or do something different they didn't give that so I had to I was constantly testing the boundaries and seeing how far I could go or where I could go because it's like well if you don't if you don't go to the edge you don't know where the edge is and there's always so much past that so no, I was I was I think I was born driven I don't know any different uh, but I had good role models so my dad was an excellent role model for um, athleticism. He got very sick though, so he had to stop his career. But then, and he had because he had um, ended up having two kidney transplants. But then later in his life, he went to the World Transplant Games and ran there. So it never left him. And I think that eth work ethic never left him. So that was something that we were growing up, had growing up with. And that sport was important in your life. Absolutely. I quite like, you know, the fact that, you know, having that around also taught you what, you know, it, it means to excel and to be a high performer. Now, you then went on to study occupational therapy. What was that like, um, you know, in comparison to what, you know, what you were doing prior uh, so occupational therapy is really different. It wasn't, I thought, 
I know, surely I want to be a physiotherapist or surely I want to be like many other things. Occupational therapy, I got accepted into that. I was waiting to get into physio. I had all these ideas of where I thought I wanted to go. And they, and whilst I was waiting, like my, I had to take, did make a decision. Was I going to take up the position to do my occupational therapy degree or was I going to wait and hope for another opportunity within a different degree? So, and that opportunity was going to close before the, I found out about, about the next one. And I'm like, hmm. So when I had this huge conversation with the university and I'm like, well, if I delay it, what would that look like? And, oh, well, and I, and I was working in a job that I enjoyed at the time. Um, no, it was nothing fancy. It was just a job. Um, but then they said, well, basically, we don't know how many um, openings we'll have next year, make a decision. I'm like, and and I'm really grateful they said that. They said, or the, but they also said to me, they said, look, if you hate it, after one year in, you can transfer to a degree of your choice. I'm like, okay, so one year, yeah, I can handle that. But then when I started to do my degree, I realized it, the, it wasn't being an occupational therapist. It was the way the framework of which it teaches you to think and the framework in which it allows you to look at life and look at things as a whole, as a holistic piece, you know. So I like I liken it, you know, I like the fact that in occupational therapy you're taught that the person is the centre and then, you know, next is family, next is work, next is right. So though if you you're if you're not right in the first part, then it will eventually turn up in the other parts, right? So if, and whatever a person's goals are, that's personal to them. That's important to them. So learning about a, a huge range of how people tick um, and then how that affects across all of their, their lives. And I really see that that then from my perspective as a business coach transfers across because then I look at, I look at it very holistically, the whole picture. The business owner is an individual, but all of the moving parts, how's the whole thing working together? Where are the breakdowns? And it might be as simple as the business owner isn't getting enough sleep. Oh, it could be way more complicated than that. But there are basic things that a person needs. And then it goes beyond that for functioning. Okay, well, you know, and then it can be all the way through to sales and systems and marketing and all of those things. But they all interplay. And you, you cannot eliminate one part of that. Mm -hmm. So really, that that's why I really liked occupational therapy, for the way it taught me to look at things. And, and obviously, being an athlete, I was always fascinated with, uh, anatomy and physiology so I could do that all day long absolutely it's just like a table if one leg is shorter the table gets wobbly and things start falling off and people start wondering why are the bottles shifting to one end of the table because there's no balance in that and now I can start to see you know the uh, similarities in the work that you're doing and you know obviously how your mindset um, or set up and pretty much what it is that you are now doing now. Now, there's one thing that caught me by surprise when you had your first baby and pretty much after three days, you were already back lifting heavy things. Um, some people would have been, oh, I have to nurse, I have to relax, but you were already on to the next thing. Um, is that is that something a lot of people do or is that just an Alison Wheeler uh thing <laughs> i don't know that it's what a lot of people do no i mean i competed up until maybe this is an olympic weightlifting like the sport of olympic weightlifting um i competed probably when i was maybe for five months pregnant was my last competition and then I was like, okay, yeah, maybe I need to stop because, you know, you kind of belly gets in the way eventually. It's like, all right. But I trained. Like on the morning I had my daughter, I was training and then went in to have her. I was like, and my husband was coaching that day. I said to him, oh, I feel a bit off. And then that afternoon I went into labor. So, I, but, but I had, because I had that goal, like I had literally timed 
everything backwards from from that goal because that's what I thought I was going to do was be back in the gym training and be attending the Commonwealth Games. But, um, you know, priorities change. And pretty much from then on, you realize this this wasn't it and you shifted gears. Um, yeah, 100%, which isn't always easy to do, Prosper. Do you know what I mean? Like when you realize, and I see this dilemma with a lot of people when they're, they're not, we don't always have an ease for change. I don't know that I still find change that easy. Okay, if I choose it. Um, but I do see that dilemma with with that delay in ability to change because we, whether that's the fear of unknown because you don't know, you know, what is going to happen. But often I think it comes back to whether or not it, an individual believes that they can make the next thing go right. Trusting in oneself that you will make it go right. And I think I could walk away from that that idea or that goal, though it had been my goal for a long time, I could walk away from that goal because I knew I could make something else work. It was just a matter of what was the next thing. Like I hadn't, I wasn't so, it wasn't, it wasn't a focus of a loss. And I think as an athlete, something that you learn to do very well is you learn to lose. You learn to lose well and you learn to lose a lot. And I think as a life skill, learning to lose is really important. And it's an important life skill for business owners because you will lose more than you win. Mm, it's just like when that. we win, we win. The 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 winning out drowns out all the losing. But if you get stuck on a loss, you know, I see this all the time, that person gets stuck on something that didn't go right or a loss can find it very difficult to move past that and move to the next thing or iterate our business or grow grow our life or grow our business to the next thing. So I think it's, is it moving from success to success or is it more moving from from loss to loss so that you can enjoy the successes? Absolutely. And um, pretty much once that career shift started happening, you found yourself winning accolades you know, in the marketing business, what was that journey like? And um... yeah, I did. Um, it was tough because I was trying to get used to this whole thing of being a mum. I found that transition quite challenging, to be honest. Um, all of a sudden, you're a mum. Like, sounds really strange out loud, but you're pregnant, and then you have a baby, and now you're a mum. There's not really any period in between that. There's no adjustment period. So it's like, hmm. So I found that transition really quite challenging to, to because I knew I wasn't who I was, but I didn't know who I was becoming. So that that was a really interesting phase of life to learn, okay, well, who am I as a mum? Who would I want to be? What do I want to define myself as now? How How is that all going to work? And that was all happening whilst we were building the network marketing company. Um, and, and and that was hard work. Like, you know, we worked our tails off. I worked my butt off to, to build it to where I go. You don't build a very successful business without working hard. Um, I learned a lot. I had to learn marketing. I didn't really know my, I knew how to do word of mouth. Um, fine. But to truly advertise the market, uh, I needed to learn sales. Like it was a steep learning curve for the first few few years. I think I spent more time wondering what on the earth I was doing in that first couple of years. Uh, but then we built momentum. Um, and, you know, when we built momentum, I mean, we had some huge successes in that business. You know, biggest months, biggest record months in that business. Absolutely. And um, congratulations on that. You know, some people just you know, look into the business and be like, ah, this is probably not for me. And then they go back, um, you know, without having made any sort of attempt. And I think it's it's to do with the mindset. And I feel like this is one thing that you shine a great deal because the the one thing about the work that you you do, or maybe the 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 you know the athlete athleticism that you've got you know that of lifting heavy things lifting it and putting it back again 
your brain must be telling you <laughs> where is this going to lead us and and things of that nature but there's a redemptive amount of um you know mindset that you have to cultivate now obviously this is important now moving into what you now teach people because going from a six figure business to a seven figure business you completely have to change the person you're becoming like you had to become a mother you were not that prior how do you help your clients cultivate this winning mindset especially in the face of challenges yeah look i think one of the simple simple things is you you have to know what you actually want need to know what your goals are, define what success is to you as an individual, don't jump on someone else's idea of success because it's doomed to fail you because it's not what you actually want. So what do you really want? What's your goal? What lights you up? What excites you? You know, and take the, the, take the next step. So reverse engineer it, work out what you want and chunk it all the way backwards until it's small enough that you can take another step. You know, break that all the way down into bite-sized chunks. And knowing too, working with clients, I know that most of the time they're going to be off track more than they're on track. It's a bit like flying an airplane. It's actually off course more than it's on course, right? So, but but that is the same kind of for us. It's just navigating through, um, I call it uh, following the breadcrumbs. Sometimes we can have this idea in our business of what we want and we don't know how to get there. And it can be a big preventer of someone taking the next step or doing the next thing. But we put the goal out there and it's like our mind continues to work in the background to look for reasons or evidence that that's possible. And then I, the reason I call it following the breadcrumbs is it's just those crazy ideas that come to us where, you know, you're in the shower or you're out walking or somewhere where you can't actually action it um, or write it down. And often we dismiss those things. Oh, it couldn't possibly be that. How could that, how could that help us? Or that doesn't seem like it relates to my goal. But when we follow those small little ideas that we have, like I had a client contact me last week. She's like, oh, you know, things have slowed down. I'm thinking of going, I'm thinking of just flying down to go to this conference. I'm not speaking at it, but my ideal client would be there. What do you think? And I'm like, well, you came up with it, so go for it. So yeah, but what do I do there? I said, well, you make relationships and these people can become your clients. And she's come back and she's got a renewed energy and she's got a whole lot of new, more contacts, you know, 30 or 40 new contacts to be able to build her business from, from this following breadcrumbs idea of it was just, you know, she, she has a goal, has, it got off track. She still, we brought her back to the focus of the goal. And then this idea comes and it presents herself. And she could dismiss that as being, oh, it's all too hard or, I don't know whether that makes sense because logically it probably doesn't make sense to fly to a different state, spend all day there and fly back when you're not a speaker and you don't have a stand or anything like that. Um, but that was what came up for her as a solution. Great. Now that piece of the the puzzle's been moved, now she's got more clarity on the next step. Right, that next step is coming to her. So I, I think sometimes it's it's allowing or helping people to see the answers within themselves or at least where to seek the answers in order to get to that next place. Because some often we don't necessarily know how. We don't know all the how in order to get there. And I think it's important to help people see and help them through those steps. And that's more on the spiritual side. But then you've got the actual logistics, I guess, the physical, the the things, which is more looking at systems and processes and numbers and and how all that works. So then we can back up that spiritual side with the actual doing and the numbers and the and the structure, um, because a business, you know, to operate well, we need guidelines, we need games, we need boundaries. No, no different to in a, any sport you need a boundary you need rules and within that we know then how to play mm. and we play better when we know the rules and the boundaries than if we have no guidelines whatsoever absolutely i quite like that because 
so many people just go at it and, you know, without, like you say, rules of engagement or measurement, how are you going to know when you've arrived, you know? And I like this example of your client who literally had to go without so they could come within and, you know, have to see themselves from the outside of their state even, you know, and, and look back and say, you know what, what, I've left there is exactly who I want to become. And I think that's where their renewed energy sort of comes from. And while I was looking you up, I actually noticed you've got a book along those lines, uh, living from the, um, from the inside out. First of all, tell us what inspired you to write this book and uh, what can people expect to gather from, you know, a, a remarkable book like this? Yeah, it's very much a compendium. So it, it, you know, it's a it's a personal development book. It's broken down into nine superpowers, uh, and it's it's about finding your superpowers and finding the authentic, true version of yourself. I think one of the greatest gifts that we have to the world is is to be fully expressed. Now that can be through anything, right? Some people express that through parenting. Some people express that through sport, art business is a self-expression as well so uh if we're not going all in and we're not fully expressed about business and where we want to be or our sport how do we get there and it's it's a it's a compendium so it's a workbook book in order to take you on the journey in order to be able to put that together the reason that i wrote it uh when i turned 40 I looked in the mirror and I didn't like what I saw. I thought the outside did not represent the inside. And then feedback I would get from other people was also, I'm like, how how are they seeing that? That's not who I am. And I thought, what is going on? And when I looked in the mirror and I didn't really like the version of myself that I saw, I thought I also thought, I don't want to pass this on to my daughter. I don't want her to look in the mirror at 20 or 30 or 40 or any age actually and go, I don't like what I see. So I thought, well, it's high time I fixed this. So I went on a journey. I'm like, all right, well, let me figure out how to bring that into alignment and be the express version I wanted to be. And so that the book's really that journey of, of how I came through that. Now, a large portion of that was through business and through sport. That's when I started uh, bodybuilding as an expression of, how to physically change and I thought well if I can step on if I can change my body to that degree if I can step on stage and be in a such a um, objective sport and be comfortable in my own skin standing on stage with next to nothing on and being objectified I thought well if I can just be in all of my own self I'll know I've broken through a whole lot of crappy mindset, right, in order to get there. And none of it made sense at the time. This is one of those breadcrumb things because that was, I was like, all right, I'll try that. And as I went through the journey, it really, I had to align so many areas of my life again because I realized so many were not in alignment with what I truly wanted, my values, my goals, my purpose. So it was just this, journey of realigning everything towards my purpose and my goals and that way you know like I went from being burnt out and you know that's just not really not that I don't get tired from working hard I do um, but not burnt out it's different right there's tired and burnt out um, so it, it's kind of like I find that a lot of people Burnout is something that's spoken about a lot, right, these days. A lot. A lot of people are burning out, and I'm like, but it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to get there. Um, and I think if people become in alignment, then they don't end up there. Mm, absolutely. And I quite think that um, a lot of the burnout, um, just indulge me if you can, and this is not based on any scientific study whatsoever it's just an observation you know having lived in melbourne where we were locked down for a good 284 days 
I'm thinking a lot of people had time to really reflect on who they are and what it is that they want so much that it also clicked that whatever they were doing was non-essential because nobody needed it for two years. And now they're going to have to go back to these jobs where none of that was needed. And now they're only doing it because they have to either pay for a mortgage or to put kids through school and things like that. And I'm supposing this is where a lot of this burnout might be coming from and the, the, the alignment of is this really worthwhile at a soul level? I don't know. Maybe you can comment on that. Um, you know, just it is an observation. Oh, look, and I'm not a doctor either, but um, having worked in the health field for a long time and also through my own journey, I wholeheartedly, because I, I think just turning up to do something because you get a paycheck this is not fulfilling. Yes, at times we all need to do that, right? Like we we have to do things in order to to be paid and in order to survive. We need money. There's nothing wrong with having money. I think having a lot of money is great. Money is not a dirty word, right? And I think having good money conversations is a good thing too because most of us don't have a good money mindset um, and also can't talk freely about money. Uh, but I think there is a there is this whole misalignment and people have lost their way a little bit of, okay, well, what is my purpose? And and then when liberties are taken away, you question, can I actually create what I want, right? And people get fearful as well uh, of whether or not how much can I control that and well, I do, what if what if this happens? What if that happens? And we get stuck in all these what ifs and questioning and and that is a dangerous territory for your mind to go, right? It's like stay out of that zone, you know, focus on, if you're focused on where you want to go, you, you are drawing the future towards yourself or you towards the future. But if you aren't focused on where you want to go, well, really, all the only other place you have to look is the past, and you keep pulling that forward with you. Um, and I think that that can also lead to a lot of a lot of burnouts. It's where someone's focused and looking, as well as that misalignment of values and and being off off their purpose line, off off what they're here for. Absolutely, and that's pretty much some of the things that you help people go through. You know, with their business, they help their wealth and things of that nature. I noticed um, you offer a free strategy session. Could you maybe walk us through what people can expect in that session and how um, people can sign up to one of those? Yeah, absolutely. So when someone, they can jump on my website and um, sign up. So they'll complete a business assessment, which goes through looking at holistically, looking all areas of their business. And we look, and that will allow me to understand kind of where they're at, where they want to be. And then we work through that assessment and what are the strategies? What do you actually need to do to improve the areas that are lagging in order to be able to hit your goals? And the ones that are going well, how can we accelerate those forward? So it's really, you know, so someone can actually walk away with strategies that they can implement in their business to to change it, to, to improve it um, after that 45-minute call. So people can jump on my website, which is theallisonwheeler.com, and they can sign up for a strategy session there. Absolutely. I'll make sure that those links are in the show notes so that people can actually get started on there. Now, I was actually just, um, you know, thinking because you present a unique approach I mean, obviously, having been a professional athlete and you've actually worked within a business that you've, you know, um, exceeded the six figure mark to the seven figure mark. And so many coaches and maybe consultants out there are coaches because maybe they just discovered they can't be employed anymore because of their situation or they would have gone um, you know, at a conference interstate and walked over some calls and came back and decided, oh, I'm going to be a coach. But, you know, your background as a professional athlete just really adds a whole different dimension to your coaching style. Now, how do you think the principles from the world of ath athletics translate into the realm of business coaching? Because like you say, there's a bit of similarities, but 
wanted you to maybe put the mod in the open so that people can really understand the unique uh, offering that you bring? Look, I think um, from a business takes resilience. It takes a lot of resilience and it takes a a my it takes a special kind of mindset not everyone will be a business owner not everyone i think needs to be a business owner uh, so first and foremost is that that clarity around goals because i do work with a lot of people who are not and, and i'll ask you know what's your goal it's one of the first things i always ask and people aren't that clear and we wonder why we aren't getting clear results because as an athlete, you are working towards one goal, always, and and then you are uh, you have a very structured plan and strategy towards that goal, and then you are continuously and constantly reviewing your progress towards that goal, so you can iterate and change whatever is needed, and tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak, and tweak until you get there. So for me, working with a business is the same. It's what's the goal? What's our strategy and plan? How are we evaluating that and looking at it? And what tweaks do we need to make along the way? Because it will require a lot of tweaking. There will be things we find out that don't work, things that do work. Where are the gaps? You know, how can we plug those gaps? What are we, what are we doing to improve that? Um, do we need to bring in more resources? Is that more education? Is that more training? Is that a process that needs to be completely different? Is there a process that's completely redundant, right? So as an athlete, if you had a biomechanical deficiency, you fix it. You work on that biomechanical deficiency. You don't keep doing the same thing through a biomechanical deficiency because you get hurt and that's your career done. So in a business, if there's a deficiency or a system or a process that's broken or it's inefficient, then we fix it. Right? Don't wait till, oh, wait, hold on, let's see how broken we can make it. It's too costly. Mm. You know, it, it costs you money to have broken systems. But sometimes we're, as a business owner, I notice people are afraid to necessarily change that or and sometimes it's that you just don't have enough systems in place have worked with a business recently very successful business turning over well over seven figures um, but still their organizational chart was a mess um, and there weren't the communication lines were confused so there was a lot of inefficiencies and that made a big difference to their bottom line because it was that people who aren't people who are stagnant and not efficient and effective cost your business a lot of money because they're not producing. So if someone's not producing at their capacity, there's a cost. So it's, you know, I think that there's a lot of correlation in that way because as an athlete, you are looking for maximum efficiency uh, and in, in the shortest possible time frame. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's say you're an athlete and you're supposed to run a hundred meter race. You only have, I don't know, what's the fast run these days? Is it two seconds or three seconds? I don't know, on the clock. And you have to do a lot of training for just that two seconds. And that would cost your career or advance your career. And I like that you've brought about systems. Um, some very educated person taught me that systems is actually an acronym that stands for save yourself stress, time, effort, and money. And um, when you don't have systems in place, everything is just haphazard. And when things are all over the place, um, you definitely are not um, in control and you can't pick up those breadcrumbs that you were talking about, Alison. Now, there's this statement in, uh, in Australia, Alison, and maybe you can concur with me that uh, a lot of businesses just say, ah, she'll be all right, mate. And um, <laughs> they just go on and bury their head in the sand. What what would you say to people like that? Oh, yeah, that is possibly the saying that I like the very least in Australia. And, you know, she'll be right, mate, because it isn't. You cannot bury your and and particularly now right like in this time that we're at financial and from a financial perspective burying your head in the sand could likely close your business down 
Mm. Right. Like we like seriously cannot be bearing our head in the sand. I think that a lot of business owners we've had, you know, where that luxury of where it's been easy to obtain customers. We haven't had to compete with a lot of other things. Customers have just sort of come to us. That's not where we're at. It's competitive. Uh, people are choosing where they're going to spend their money. So you have to be able to be not, she'll be right, mate, but actively and or, or, aggressively is not proactively. Actively and proactively building your business because, you know, that attitude of she'll be right will see business, a lot of businesses in a lot of trouble, and, and it, they, but they don't have to be. And I, But often I think, too, being vulnerable to, enough to ask for help mm-hmm. because sometimes people might say cliched saying such as she'll be right. They're not really looking. They're not really looking if they are all right, like at their numbers really or they don't know to ask for help or they don't want to ask for help or they're afraid to ask for help or they're embarrassed to ask for help, you know, suffering in silence. But, you know, no one is successful on their own ever. No one's created big success doing it alone. And I think it's a very sane thing to ask for help. Mm. Right? It's okay to ask for help. Good, great. It's not a failure. It's sanity. (laughs) <laughs> right it's the same thing to ask for help um so you know if you need help you need help absolutely and there's always somebody out there um you know that's willing to help you and obviously with your um mannerism and your mindset um i think it was zig ziglar that said help enough people get what they want and you too will get that which um which you want and uh for those people that always think, oh, she'll be all right, mate. Like Alison has said, you can't see yourself from the outside. And I think I'm going to take that from from this call today because whatever it is, um, you know, how you do anything is how you do everything. So if you don't show up for yourself and ask for help, then nobody's going to know uh, whether you need help or not. Don't they say that the squeakiest wheel gets the grease? And, um, you know, (laughs) they sure do. And it's so true, right? So why not be a a squeaky joint? Yeah. Right. Be a squeaky joint in your business, though, and in your life. Like, don't suffer in silence. Ask, what's the worst that could happen? You get help. Absolutely. Now, Alison, you've taken us on a journey. I mean, from your occupational therapy days to you running your network marketing business and now being um you know a high performance coach for businesses and personal um you know affairs what's next what can people expect from the Alison Wheeler well I am launching my uh soon I'm going to launch the course that goes with my book um which I'm very excited to do so I'm just setting that up and doing the filming for that uh, and I look forward to running some in-person events as well um, and continuing. Look, the goal is to help every business, if we can, 2.5 million businesses, right? If I can help all of them, how brilliant would that be? Oh, absolutely. I mean, each and every one of these businesses, not a lot of them are actually, um, you know, posting a profit. And this is something that really needs to change if we are to be, do and have a happier existence, especially like you said, the world is now open. You know, our clients are now coming from just about anywhere in the world. So if we're not going to be showing up with the systems and being very competitive, we might just not be all right. Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> fantastic now Alison I can't thank you for the time that we spent on the call today um learned quite a lot and uh yeah I've got newfound knowledge especially me being able to see myself from the outside yeah look and it's been an absolute pleasure uh thank you so much for having me on I could talk to you all day long <laughs> fantastic and there you have it folks a journey packed with insights, inspiration, and actionable strategies to propel you towards your own path 
to prosperity. But remember, the adventure doesn't stop here. I encourage you to re-watch this episode because there's so much that we went through with Alison because she really is passionate about business owners building a business that works for them and not just creating yet another job. Because what's the whole point in you showing up and um, you know going through all the pain of running a business and yet you're not posting a profit. And if this wasn't really for you and you're in the She'll Be Alright crew, why don't you share this with somebody who really wants to get somewhere? And as Alison has said, she is there to help businesses to thrive. Now, while you're there, don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more transformative content like this. Until next time, keep striving and keep thriving and never stop pursuing your dreams. This is Prosper and Alison. We're signing off the Online Prosperity Show. Bye for now. <music>